So the other week I was out for my morning walk and because life is busy, uh, I have to get up super early if I'm going to go for a walk and because it's May in Melbourne, uh, it was dark when I was out walking and the street that I walk on does not have any street lights in it. And as I was walking along, I happened at one point, the trees opened up a little bit and I looked up at the sky and it was so clear and so fine. It was so beautiful. And just above me, there were two bright, shining stars, like magnificent diamonds in the sky that were twinkling down at me. And as I kept walking and looking at these magnificent stars, just so beautiful, some words came to my mind. And they were, they will still be there when the sun comes up. You just won't be able to see them. And as I do when words come to my mind that I don't feel are my own, I I kept going over these words and thinking, what is it that these are trying to tell me? Maybe God's trying to say something to me through these words. And as I continued to reflect and think upon it as I walked, I realized that one thing that God was saying to me was that he is always there. No matter what happens, no matter what changes take place, God is always there. Day turns to night, night turns to day, seasons change, situations change, but God remains the same. No matter what happens, he is still there. We are in a series looking at the final book of the Bible, Revelation. And as we look today at Revelation chapter 4, this is a key message that God gave to the people of the time, but he gives to us today as well, that he is always there. And not only that, but he is in control. And this is an incredible message that no matter what happens, no matter what season we're in, no matter who is in power, seriously, the the timing of this sermon is so divine that on the day after we have our election, we are talking about a chapter that reminds us that God is always there. He is always in control, is incredible. And we're going to look at this chapter and explore what it, can be, what it said to the people at the time and what it can be saying to us today. Now, before we read uh, Revelation chapter 4, let's remind ourselves of the context that this is being revealed in. You may not have been a part of the series or you may have forgotten or let's just remember. This is 96 AD when John receives this message, this vision. And it is 60 years after Jesus' death and his resurrection, he's ascended into heaven. And the disciples have done, through the Holy Spirit, an incredible work of spreading the news about Jesus Christ, that he is the Messiah, that he is here to save the world. And the message has been spread, and thousands Thousands of people have come to believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah and they have followed him and they have started gathering. But the situation at the time was the rulers at the time were making it incredibly difficult for them. Tim mentioned in his first sermon, some 40,000 Christians had been killed by one particular ruler. Like we're talking incredible persecution We're not talking about them just being called names or, you know, pushed out of the social circles. We're not talking about that they were, you know, trolled on the internet or anything like that. These these people's lives were in threat because of their faith in God through Jesus Christ. And even the disciples themselves had been martyred and killed for the cause And here we have a situation where, as Bob mentioned last week, people are having to declare their worship to the earthly king in order to be able to trade 
and to be able to have their livelihoods and to be able to function in society, they had to worship the earthly king. And so here we have John, a disciple of Jesus who refused to worship the earthly king. And so he was put in prison. And this prison was a small island in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea called on Patmos. And there was where they put all the criminals and those, the, the political troublemakers. And here John finds himself because he refused to bow down and worship the earthly ruler. And in this context, he receives this vision from God, a vision of heaven, a vision of what God is in heaven. But it's not some vision that is like far, far away, you know, up so far in the sky we can't reach it. It's not a vision that we can just hope to embrace, you know, if when, once we die and we pass away and then we can experience this. No, God draws close to John right where he is, in a prison in Patmos, and he reveals who God is at that very day. And this is what we read in Revelation 4. Now, often when we read the Bible, sometimes we might get you to stand up for the Bible reading. Sometimes we might ask you to follow along in your Bibles and we'll have it up on the screen and you can follow along. Today, this Bible passage is filled with so much beautiful imagery. If you feel comfortable, I encourage you to close your eyes because your imagination is greater than anything we can put on the screen. So as I read Revelation 4, it's only 11 verses, it's okay. You shouldn't fall asleep in that amount of time unless you've been up with babies and children. Then you're allowed to fall asleep, all right? This is your time. But if you're comfortable, I encourage you, let's close our eyes and listen to Revelation 4 and the incredible vision that God gave to John. After this I looked up, writes John, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance like jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white. They had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center, around the throne, were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. And the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings, day and night. They never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honour and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honour and power for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. Amen. You may now open your eyes. 
The key image that we see in this vision is the throne. This incredible throne that everything else around it turns and reflects on what the throne truly is. This throne which is the centre of power. A throne represents the control centre. And boy, did the people at the time fully understand the power of the throne. The power that the one on the throne could put over a nation, could impact all people because of the one who sat on the throne. And this throne was magnificent. This throne was the key part of the vision. But unlike my image, there was someone sitting on the throne. There was someone present on the throne, and that was the Lord of Lords, the God of Gods. That was the Lord God Almighty who was sitting on the throne. And as the, the living creatures spoke about this God that sits on the throne, they said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Now, if you've been around church for a long time, like I have, we use this word almighty quite a bit. I'll often include it in my prayers. We have it in our songs a lot. This whole idea that God is almighty. But if I, if I break it down, it's all might. This king, this God of ours that sits on the throne is all might. He is all powerful. He is all in control. He is almighty. He has all dominion. This is what was setting him apart from any other earthly king that they had come in contact with. He was different to all other rulers because he was the greatest in power. And every single one of the images that we see in the rest of these, this vision points towards the throne and gives us a greater understanding of the one who was on the throne, who is on the throne, and who will always be on the throne. So I'm going to look at all the other the images that we see in this vision to help us understand who is our God, who is our God who sits on the throne. And thanks to Daryl Johnson's excellent book that we've been following in this series, helping us understand how all the different images point towards the Lord Almighty on this throne. Because the people at the time knew that a God who is only powerful is a God to be feared. If there is a God that only pushes his power and his might, if there are rulers that are only on, on for control and for power and for dominion, they are to be feared. And a lot of them were on earth at that point in time. It led to destruction and death and fear for the people. But that wasn't the only image we have. The first image we, we hear coming from the throne is the rainbow. And as Tim mentioned in his intro to Revelation, there are so many Old Testament references in Revelation, and this is one of them. We first hear about the rainbow in the story of Noah, when things were so terrible and so heinous in God's eyes on the world that he wanted to destroy it completely. And so he sent a flood and everything was destroyed except for Noah, his family and the animals on an ark. And when it was all over, God put a rainbow in the sky to declare and to promise that he would never flood the earth again. The rainbow tells us of two things about this ruler on the throne. First, he is a king that keeps his promises. He is a king that makes promises and he keeps them, he abides by them, and the people are better off from the promises that he makes for us. And secondly, this is a God of mercy. Because are there times in our world, in our history, where we look back and we think it would have been better for God just to have wiped everything out, to annihilate a certain nation or a certain leader? Absolutely. 
But God is a God of mercy. And through the rainbow, we are reminded that he is a merciful, gracious, compassionate, loving God, willing to offer mercy even when we don't deserve it. He is not just a God who sits on his throne and wields his power and his might, but he is a God who spares people and sheds mercy and grace and love wherever he goes. This is the difference between our God on the throne and all, all earthly leaders, that balance of power and mercy. But it doesn't finish there. We then have the lightning and the thunder that comes from the throne. Now, this is a God who controls the natural elements. No matter how powerful earthly rulers may be, they can't control the weather, right? How many of us in Melbourne know that? No matter how powerful we are, no matter how much money we have, we cannot control the weather. And yet this is a God that even the natural elements obey him. They come from his throne with their power and the, the lightning and the thunder. But not only that, this reminds us of God's presence. Lightning and thunder are there in God's presence, not just here in Revelation, but all the way back in Exodus. I'd love to have the time to go through the Exodus story for those who know it. If you don't, Google it, Exodus 1, start reading, open your Bibles. This is where the people of Israel were slaves in Egypt, treated so poorly. And God redeems them and saves them through working through Moses. Miraculous, 10 miraculous plagues on the Egyptians until finally they release God's people and they're able to leave. God miraculously divides the Red Sea so they can walk on dry ground. This is a God who saves and redeems his people. And as they head into the desert to create a new nation, there is arguments and chaos and Moses is struggling to keep this nation together. And so God decides to come down on Mount Sinai. He brings his presence down onto Mount Sinai to speak to Moses. And in this, he ends up giving him the Ten Commandments. But their description of the presence of God on Mount Sinai in Exodus 19 is this. There was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. This is their understanding of God's presence here on earth. And so when God gives them a vision, he gives John a vision of heaven and this throne, he is highlighting, this is me, this is my presence, I am on the throne. No matter what is happening on earth, this is me, I am here. I am the Almighty. I am forever. I am sitting on the throne. And even in Exodus, it goes on. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it like fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace and the whole mountain trembled violently. And the next image we see in Revelation is the fire. The lamps blazing before the throne. Fire, not only meaning the presence of God, but fire was an example of purifying and healing at that time. That's what fire represented. Healing and purifying. How different is this ruler on the throne of heaven to all the rulers on the throne, particularly at the time when John was getting this vision. Not just a God who wanted, or a ruler, to wield his power and have control and might over the people. This is a ruler, our God on the throne, who is just as mighty, even more mighty than any ruler on earth. But he doesn't just rule with power and might. 
but he rules with mercy to purify, to heal, to bring wholeness, to bring freedom, to bring redemption to the people. That is the God on our throne. And then one of my favourite images in this passage is the sea. The sea that is before the throne. Now, a sea often represented chaos. Sea represented absolute chaos and mayhem. In the time, it was, it was unpredictable. It was dangerous. And when they uh, had a vision or represented sea, it often meant uh, uncontrollable chaos and out of control and dysfunction and disorder. But what does the sea before the throne of our Lord and God look like? Sea of glass, as clear as crystal. I love this because God in his vision is acknowledging that the sea is there, right? He's acknowledging that there is chaos. He is acknowledging what our world often feels like. Chaotic, disordered, out of control. But when the sea is before the throne of God, it's as clear as crystal. How great is our God? How great is the God that is on the throne? Not to bring chaos to the people, not to bring disorder or fear or discomfort, to have absolute power and dominion over them to create fear and disorder, but to bring comfort and order and mercy and love. We get an idea that this world is not always going to be, but later on in Revelation, not to spoil things for what's coming up, but later on in Revelation, it speaks of a new heaven and a new earth, something that we can really look forward to. And in, in Revelation 21.1, it's a verse that I have heard so many times, and you may have heard it too. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the old heaven and the old earth, the earth had passed away. But that's not the end of the verse. The end of the verse says, and there will no longer any sea. The new heaven and the new earth removes all chaos, removes all disorder. It removes fear, it removes suffering, it removes grief and pain and death. This is ultimately what we are to look forward to. But the, the reminder that we have through this vision that God gave to John was that even though we have that to look forward to, it doesn't mean that now is not within our grasps of having peace and joy and control from our God because the sea before the throne is still clear as crystal. Imagine the comfort, the reassurance, the encouragement that this would have been to the people at the time. The chaos and being overwhelmed with fear and not knowing what tomorrow was going to hold for them. And yet here is God reminding them, I am on the throne. And no matter what's happening on earth, I am the almighty. I am the most powerful. I have control over all things. And I come with mercy and love and grace and compassion. And the, the living creatures that are, are next in our image, the living creatures that were there, the one that was like a lion, one like an ox, one like a man, and one like an eagle, is a reminder of the absolute dominance that God has and can have on our earth. We've already mentioned earlier, you know, what they were saying, the declaring God as the Almighty. But Rabbi Abihu, in 300 AD says this, there are four mighty creatures. The mightiest among the birds is the eagle. The mightiest among domestic animals is the ox. The mightiest among 
the wild animals is the lion and the mightiest of them all is man. And God has taken all these and secured them to his throne. What a reminder of a God who is control of all things. Not just one area, not just one nation, not just a part of our creation, but over all things. His throne is to be given glory and honour because of who he is. And the final image we have, uh, and I haven't got an image for it, is the 24 elders on their thrones. I wasn't sure if I'd fit them all on my screen, and I'm sure your imagination is even greater. The image of these elders on their thrones with their crowns, 24 of them. Now, to break it down a little bit, we've got 12 plus 12, not a maths lesson, but it is thought that this represents the 12 tribes of Israel, the people of God before Jesus, and then the 12 disciples, the people of God after Jesus. All of them, in their own right, with their own resources as, as their, their crowns are on their head, but they are giving glory and honour to God. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and praise. And historians have gone back and looked at different things that were spoken of the rulers at the time and rulers on earth. And there was one particular ruler that every time he walked into a room, groups of people had to shout out, worthy, worthy, worthy. I, I just couldn't think of anything worse. People shouting at me walked in the room. But this was something that happened. And they looked at the songs that were written about the rulers, the earthly rulers at the time. Great words spoken of their power and their dominance. These are some of the words within songs for earthly rulers. Worthy was declared. Holy one was a ruler. Salvation belongs to you. Authority is yours. Worthy to receive power. Righteous are your judgments. Our Lord and God, Lord of the earth, Lord of the world. These, these words ring a bell for me because I sing them all the time in church, right? But these are words that were spoken of earthly rulers. But here in this vision, these 24 elders are taking back the words of praise given to earthly leaders and giving them to the only one who is truly worthy of all our praise. You are worthy, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honour and power, reclaiming what people are giving their allegiance to the earthly rulers and reminding us that our allegiance is only to God, that things may change in our world. Day becomes night, night becomes day, seasons change, powers change, things change in our lives. But God is the only one always and forever on the throne. He was, he is, and he is to come. And that gives us hope, it gives us purpose, it gives us encouragement for our day to day, that no matter what is happening in our world, he is still on the throne. He still holds all the might, so much might that whatever crowns we wear, whatever resources we may have, whatever power and authority we may have in our lives, he is so much greater. And we are in a better place when we take those off and we put them at his feet. Because he is the one on the throne. He is the only one who has all might and all control, but leads with absolute mercy and grace. He keeps his promises. His aim is to free and redeem his people and to bring us into healing and wholeness. He has done all things so that all of us may enter into a close relationship with God. He is 
the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He sits on the throne. And no matter what chaos may happen in our world, when we are before the throne of God, he is able to bring peace and harmony wherever he is present. As I finish up today, I would love for us to spend some time in prayer. Because no matter what is happening in our world, I don't have to be a prophet. I don't have to be necessarily in tune with where anyone is in this, in this room or online as they're watching. To know that many of us are experiencing experiencing chaos in our lives. It may not be the similar kind of chaos that the people in 96 AD were experiencing, but there is chaos in our world, is there not? And today is a reminder for us to come before our God who sits on the throne with might and power and mercy and grace and bring our chaos before him so that he can make it like a sea of glass. So can I encourage us all to stand? And as you do so, I invite the band to come forward. And I would like you to think of maybe there is a time of chaos in your life right now. Maybe there is something that is happening in your world that feels chaotic that feels out of control. Maybe it's something within your actual body. Maybe it is your health that feels chaotic and out of control. Maybe there are things that are being said over you, gossip or words that are being spoken over you that are bringing fear and chaos and a lack of control in your life. Maybe there's a relationship in your life that feels out of control. You need wisdom, you need discernment, you're not sure what the future is going to hold. Maybe that is the chaos in your world. Maybe it's something in your place of employment. Something that feels toxic, there's something that's not right. Whether it's within the the leadership or within colleagues that some things that are going on there is chaos maybe it's not chaos for you but there is chaos in a loved one's life and you would love to step in and intercede for them can I encourage you to close your eyes as we pray and as we think of the chaos that is in our world whether it's in distant countries we know there is chaos absolute chaos in our world. Maybe it's a chaos that is close to home, within your own life. If you would love prayer for that, we are just going to pray that the God, the ruler of heaven and earth is going to bring calm and bring peace and bring might and bring control to this area. If you have an area of chaos in your life and you are comfortable, everyone's eyes are closed, no one's looking, feel free to raise your hand. Let's give this chaos to God because our God is not a God of chaos. Our God is not a God of destruction. Our God is not a God who wants uh, horrible things to happen to us. Our God is not a God of ill health or destruction. Our God is a God of might and power. Our God is a God who can do all things things beyond our imagination and he wants to do that in your life not just for those back in John's time he wants to be in our lives and have this control and this calm and this peace and this authority right now so let's pray as we raise our hands God we give this chaos to you God We look at our lives and we acknowledge it is not how you created it to be. But God, you are a God who is almighty, 
No matter what is happening, you are mighty. You are powerful. You have all authority. And God, we give this chaos to you. We lay it at your throne. And we pray, God, that you will bring peace, that you will bring harmony, that you will bring wisdom and discernment. God, bring your mercy, God. Bring your graciousness. Bring your love and your compassion. And God, for us who are experiencing this chaos, Holy Spirit, we pray that you will come and bring healing and wholeness. Not in anything that we can do, but because you can do all things. And we lay it at your throne, God. And we thank you and praise you. We sing holy, holy, holy because you are our God. We declare it every single day that no matter how chaotic our world may feel, we declare you are our God and you have all power and dominion. And we praise you and we thank you in your mighty name. Amen. Amen.